Hey guys! So in this section we will go over different types of arrhythmias. First I broke them down into five categories, which are sinus bradycardia, AV blocks, supraventricular arrhythmias, pre-excitation syndrome or Wolf-Parkinson white syndrome, and ventricular arrhythmias. Alright, so let's start with sinus bradycardia. In sinus bradycardia, patient has normal sinus rhythm and a heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute. Sinus bradycardia is caused by basically anything that can cause excessive vagal tone or medications that decrease the heart rate like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or any other medication you can think about. Management depend upon symptoms. If patient is asymptomatic, there is no treatment necessary. However, if the patient is symptomatic, then atropine is the first-line treatment. If that doesn't work, then pacemaker is the definitive treatment. Now let's move on to heart blocks. As you all know, there are three different types of heart blocks. First degree, second degree, and third degree. Second degree has two types. Type 1 or Mobitz 1 and type 2 or Mobitz 2. Let's start with first degree block. How do you recognize it on EKG? It'll have prolonged PR interval. When I say prolonged, it will be more than 20 milliseconds or 0.2 seconds. These patients don't need any kind of treatment. Second degree block divides into two types, type 1 and type 2. What is the main difference between these two? EKG findings and management. Type 1 has prolonged PR until P wave is dropped. In type 2, PR interval is fixed and there is a sudden drop of beat without any PR prolongation. Again, you might have a question on your exam from second degree heart blocks, so make sure you know the EKG differences because there's a good chance they will show you an EKG and ask you a question about that. Sample questions could be something like, what is the diagnosis? Or what is the next step in management for this patient? So one more time, for Mobitz 1 block, PR prolongs until P wave is dropped, and in Mobitz 2, heartbeat suddenly drops without PR prolongation. Now management for Mobitz 1, you don't do anything. For Mobitz 2, you proceed with the pacemaker. Now let's move on to third degree block, which is also complete heart block. On an EKG, you can see that all atrial impulses are blocked, and treatment is pacemaker. So remember that for first degree heart block in Mobitz 1, patients don't need treatment. And for Mobitz 2 and third degree heart block, patient is pacemaker. Make sure you look online or in your books for heart block EKGs. There's a good chance that USMLE will have at least one question about this. So this is it for heart blocks. All right, now let's move on to supraventricular arrhythmias. I'm going to go over five main types of supraventricular arrhythmias. First one is sinus tachycardia, which means on EKG you can see normal P wave and QRS complex and your heart rate is over 100. For now, just remember that sinus tachycardia has normal P wave. This can be due to any disease because almost anything can increase your heartbeat. Your heart rate will go up when you have fever, any kind of pain, anxiety, anemia, hypotension, or anything else you can think of. So treatment for this is treating underlying disease. Now let's move on to paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Main difference is that in paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, you don't have P wave. I forgot to add that in the box, but that is the main difference between sinus tachycardia and this one in P wave. Here you don't have a P wave, and in a sinus tachycardia you do, so know that difference. Now paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia can be due to ischemia, digoxin, caffeine, or alcohol. For management, you want to see if patient is stable or not. What does it mean by stable? You'll see a lot of boxes saying stable or unstable, so it's important to know what it means. Unstable means patient neither has chest pain, hypotension, shortness of breath, or confusion. This is very important, so let's go over this one more time. What does it mean when it says patient is unstable? It means patient either has chest pain, hypotension, confusion, or shortness of breath. 
If patient is unstable, next step is cardioversion. You can't try any medication if the patient is unstable. This is true for all other arrhythmias. So basic rule is, if patient is unstable and has arrhythmia, you want to use cardioversion on that patient. Which one? Synchronized or unsynchronized? Answer is easy. You only use unsynchronized for ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. For everything else, you use synchronized cardioversion. Now, if a patient is stable, then we want to try vagal maneuvers like carotid massage. If that doesn't work, the next step is to give IV, verapamil, or adenosine. If these drugs don't work, then you have other medical options like IV digoxin, IV propranolol, or esmolol. Digitalis is the same as digoxin, so don't get confused if you see something else in your book. If these medical terms don't work, the next step is DC cardioversion. All right, now let's move on to multifocal atrial tachycardia, or MAT. These are mainly due to some kind of respiratory problems. Your keyword for EKG is at least three different types of P wave, and heart rate is 100 to 200 beats per minute. So remember, three different types of P wave. Management is mainly to treat respiratory problem by improving oxygenation and ventilation. Treatment depends on LV function, so if left ventricular function is preserved, then you want to try calcium channel blockers, digoxin, amiodarone, or IV flaconide. I have beta blockers here, but be careful with beta blockers if these patients have respiratory problems. If left ventricular function is not preserved, then you want to use digoxin, diltiazem, or amiodarone. So for multifocal atrial tachycardia, main thing is at least three different P waves and all these patients have respiratory disease. Let's move to atrial flutter. We will do atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation together since you want to know the main differences between these two. So in flutter, atrial rate is 250 to 300 and ventricular beat is every two to three atrial beats. In AFib, atrial rate is over 400, and ventricular rate is, seven, is about 75 to 175. So your heart is beating irregularly, and this rhythm is irregularly irregular. On flutter EKG, you'll see a sawtooth pattern, whereas in AFib, you cannot identify P waves. And again, the rhythm is irregularly irregular. I suggest that you look over both EKGs online or in your books and know how to identify each one. There's a good chance you will get a question about this topic. AFib is mainly due to coronary artery disease, MI, hypertension, pericarditis, PE, thyroid disease, sepsis, diabetes, and etc. Patient will present fatigue dyspnea, palpitation, dizziness, but all these symptoms are nonspecific. You can have many diseases with these symptoms, but main difference is irregularly irregular pulse. Let's move to management. So I broke it down into acute management and chronic management. For acute management, first you want to ask, is patient hemodynamically stable? If the answer is no, then you move to synchronized cardioversion. If patient is stable, then you want to control patient's heart rate. Sorry guys, I forgot to add an error here, where it says duration more than 48 hours. So if duration of AFib is more than 48 hours, then you want to get TEE to see if there is a thrombus in left atrium. If there is a thrombus, then you want to anticoagulate this patient for three weeks. If there is no thrombus, then cardioversion. We can use cardioversion to convert rhythm into normal sinus rhythm. This can be done by antiarrhythmic medications, but remember that you never use medication to convert rhythm. Best option is synchronized cardioversion. Now let's move on to chronic management of AFib. You might get a question from this section, so make sure you know how to manage these patients. So first you want to control patient's rate with either beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. 
And then you want to anticoagulate these patients, but there are criteria for anticoagulation, which is called CHADS2 score. So here, C stands for CHF, H stands for hypertension, A stands for age more than 70, and D stands for diabetes. All these get one point each, and S2 stands for stroke, which gets two points. So once you write your patient, you add all of them up, and get total. Anticoagulation management depends on the score. If a patient has zero points, then this is called lone atrial fibrillation. And these patients don't need any anticoagulation therapy. If a patient has three or more points, the patient needs anticoagulation with warfarin. When patient is on warfarin, you have to control patients I and R between two and three, so management is clear if patient has zero points, or three or more points. When a patient has one or two points, then you have to discuss risk versus benefit of anticoagulation therapy with patient and move on from there. So this is all you need to know for atrial fibrillation. This looks a little bit long, but just go over this one or two more times and you should be fine. All right, now let's move to Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Here on EKG, keyword is delta wave which are upward deflection before QRS contacts. If you look at the EKG on the web or in your books, you can identify them easily. Here, other key information is to avoid beta blockers, digoxin, or calcium channel blockers, because they can block conduction through the normal pathway and force electricity to move from accessory pathway. So avoid all the drugs that, you know, that can slow down the conduction system of your heart. For management, you want to see if the patient is stable. If yes, then treatment is propanamide, and if the patient is not stable, then cardioversion. Definitive treatment is radiofrequency, catheter, ablation. Okay, so let's move to our last type of arrhythmias. So first thing we want to remember here is all ventricular arrhythmias have wide QRS complex. So if you see a question about wide QRS, then you know the question is about one of these three. One more thing you want to know is, in ventricular fibrillation, patient does not have pulse. Patient with torsads and VTEP may or may not have pulse, but patient with VFib never has pulse. In this section, when I say hemodynamically stable, I'm not talking about pulse or no pulse. When a patient does not have pulse, in any of these cases, the next step is defibrillator. So being said that, let's start with torsades. On EKG, you can see spindle-shaped QRS complexes. So make sure you look at EKG in your book or on the web as they are very easy to identify. For management, you want to ask, is patient hemodynamically stable? If the answer is no, then cardioversion. If the answer is yes, then treatment is with IV magnesium sulfate. Make sure you remember this treatment, IV magnesium sulfate. Magnesium is only used for torsades. You can also try acute pacing. But make sure you follow these patients' potassium and magnesium levels. If this is a congenital problem, then you can try beta blockers and acute pacing. All right, let's move to VTAP. Make sure you know the EKG difference between VTAC and VFib. In VTAC, you have three or more ventricular beats consecutively at a rate more than 120. Where in VFib, you cannot see Q waves. QRS complexes are irregular and dissolved. Please go over and compare these two EKGs from your book or from the web. Management on VTAC depends on hemodynamic stability, or in other words, does the patient have pulse. If the patient has pulse, you can use IV on the other one, if no pulse, then cardioversion. As I said before, you can use unsynchronized cardioversion for pulses, VTAC, and VFib. Here, for management, I put the question of patient is hemodynamically stable or not. Most of these patients will not be stable, so you want to shock the patient with unsynchronized cardioversion and then give epinephrine or vasopressin, and then another shock or more drugs. One more thing you want to remember is you never want to give intracardiac drugs 
which are stabbing patient in the chest with syringe and give medication. These guidelines are always changing, so you want to check the latest ACLS guideline for VTAC and VFIT. But main thing you want to know from here is you can use unsynchronized cardioversion for VFIT patients. Well, I think this ends up our section of autoresmias. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions or are interested in receiving this flowchart, please feel free to email us at usmlesaver at gmail.com or write on our Facebook page and we will be happy to answer any of your questions. If you like this video, subscribe so you can get updates on more videos as we are currently working on more USMLE Step 2 CP videos in this format. Have a great day and good luck studying for your USMLEs.